Hello. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, my name is Gleb Smirnov. Uh, I'm with FreeBSD as long as I consider myself an adult person, a uh, committer for almost 20 years, and for the last almost 10 years, I'm working at Netflix Open Connect team um, where we use FreeBSD. So a short introduction to what is Open Connect to those who are not uh, aware. It's a global CDN that creates a very large fraction of global traffic. And as a single application, we are basically the biggest source of traffic on the internet. Uh, power of, powered by thousands of uh, servers or appliances, as we call them, or caches. And they all run FreeBSD. Um, and in this talk, I, I want to share our experience on how we ma maintain the modified FreeBSD fork uh, in, in our team. And so, so this probably is the most loaded slide in my talk. And I ask you not to rush with reading it. <laughs> Better listen to me. <laughs> So, uh, so the, the Open Connect started in 2012, and it was basically unmodified for busy stable um, that had Nginx on it, and basically that's it. And that was the baseline that was able to serve uh, less than a half of a 10 gigabit interface. And um, Netflix, Open Connect together with Nginx, started to optimize that. Um, and in several years, um, uh, yeah, very quickly we realized that most of the optimization should be done in the kernel. Uh, so in several years, uh, we were, so we did jump to FreeBSD 10. Uh, we did a jump, uh, so we moved from one stable branch to other stable branch. I want to emphasize that. And we had basically two large patches to, to the kernel that provided us with increased performance, uh, which was a synchronous send file and VM page cache. And uh, here I got a red, red line. So what this, does this red line mean? It means that at this point, we consciously realize that we are maintaining a FreeBSD fork. Because before that, it was just like a natural process. OK, let's patch here, let's improve here, and so on. But at that point, we realized that we are going to maintain a FreeBSD fork, and um, we did some radical changes uh, in the late of 2015, early 2016. So first, we moved to Git, uh, and FreeBSD was still on subversion. Second, we did our last jump. We jumped to FreeBSD current, because we don't want to do any more jumps. Uh, third, uh, which I'm going to talk later, instead of hacking in the FreeBSD directory, we embedded FreeBSD directory into our repo. So, so, so basically, FreeBSD became a subtree of a bigger repo instead of being a uh, modified repo. So, so th this sounds like something obvious or trivial, but actually it's, it makes a lot of difference. It's making you to think differently about um, what, so, so when you say we built our operating system on top of FreeBSD. It's, a, it's actually you're including FreeBSD into your operating system. Uh, okay, uh, later on that. So um, in our, uh, in our uh, Netflix talks, we always boast about gigabits per second. So I could not resist without having the third column, uh, which boasts our uh, huge speeds that we are constantly increasing. and. Um, you don't need to read through all the details. It's just like the short descriptions of the patches. But overall, overall, the amount of code that we write increases, but the amount of our divergence from the upstream stays mostly constant and sometimes shrinks, but it definitely doesn't grow significantly. And this is what I want to talk about, how, how to do that. So. Um, I, I try to make the rest of the talk more abstract, talk less about Netflix. So we're, we will talk about some abstract vendor OS that uh, we'll, we want to build on top of FreeBSD. 
Uh, so we start basically with um, empty directory or empty make file. <laughs> and I will not go into what you to put in this make file, uh, but it's trivial. And then you use git subtree module to add FreeBSD as a subtree inside your uh, inside the repo. This module will provide you the full history of FreeBSD and the exact commit hashes that the FreeBSD project uses. So you can refer to, to the commit hashes in the open source project. They will be the same in your project, uh, but living in a subtree. Uh, the alternative is git sub module, and I strongly recommend not using it. And I, I don't want to go into detail right now, but just trust me. <laughs> um, and from that point, you start developing. You hack outside of FreeBSD directory. You also hack inside FreeBSD directory, which means modifying your FreeBSD, making a fork. And there is code flow. So there is a code flow in two directions. There is a code flow that brings uh, new FreeBSD updates to your uh, operating system. And there is the opposite code flow. So l let's first talk about the code that comes from the open source community to you. So I want to divide it into two categories. Uh, the one is obvious, it's regular merges. Uh, how regular? Uh, I want to touch the topic later, uh, but uh, in short, as regular as you can do in your particular workflow. At Netflix, we do it roughly monthly. So the other thing is, taking code from the open source community that haven't even been committed to FreeBSD main. Why would you want to do that? Uh, so two reasons. Uh, some projects that you really want to use earlier than they get into FreeBSD main because you anticipate them to, pro to give you extra performance. So for example, um, on the previous slide I mentioned VM page cache. So we started to use VM page cache long before it hit FreeBSD current. We, we started to use uh, unmapped I.O. before FreeBSD current started to use it. So th this is what I called early adoption. And also, uh, you should do the same, not only for the changes that you anticipate to give you something, uh, so, some good improvements, and also for the changes that you expect to bring you degradations. So to give you an example, um, uh, recently, in FreeBSD, we switched it from OpenSL1 to OpenSL3. And at Netflix, we were afraid that this is going to, to, to make some breakages for us. Uh, so uh, instead of waiting for the OpenSL3 to hit FreeBSD main, we took it before, tested that, reported back to community, and uh, uh, so neutralized our fears about this upcoming change. So imagine from FreeBSD is uh, pretty straightforward. So because previously you added uh, subtree of FreeBSD, all following merges should also go through the subtree module. And this is how it looks like. So you create a project branch, and uh, in this project branch you do subtree merge. Uh, of course, it, uh, as long as your code diverges, it create, create conflicts, you need to resolve these conflicts. What next? Uh, the answer is obvious, test. If you, if you are using FreeBSD current, of course you want to test. Uh, this actually applies to any stable system too. <laughs> uh, so the testing uh, I categorize into two different uh, things and both are uh, very important. So one is A-B testing, which means that we test our branch that includes fresh merge of FreeBSD against the branching point. And, um, the, uh, and we check that they behave exactly the same performance-wise uh, and all, all kinds of metrics-wise there should be the same or better. Or maybe worse, but you expected this worse and you can accept that. But at least you need to be aware of what has changed. Uh, the other thing is uh, the unit tests that are running by continuous integration. Um, and this includes uh, the, the tests that are included in FreeBSD. And you should still run them, uh, despite the FreeBSD projects run them. You also should run them because your kernel configuration is probably different to what FreeBSD tests. 
so FreeBSD test just generic. Your kernel is different. Your kernel has different config. It, it, has, um, it has your own patches. So it, there, there can be a regression that didn't happen upstream, but it happens in your tree. And of course, as you develop new functionality in your fork of FreeBSD, you want to add your own tests on top of the mm, FreeBSD tests. Uh, now let's um, uh, take a uh, more detailed look at A-B testing. So A-B testing should be done uh, in an environment as close to production as you can do. Uh, at Netflix, we are um, pretty happy about that developers, uh, so because our production gives us opportunity to test in a real production. Uh, so b b the, whole, the whole CDN is built so reliably that you can literally panic a box uh, without disruption of clients. Uh, I understand that not everybody, not every company can provide such testing grounds, uh, but uh, you should try to provide the testing grounds as close to the actual runtime as you can. Uh, then you need to make sure that the A, B, A and B parts of your test are exactly same, super exactly. Uh, 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 it's, it, so for example, if, if you got a large set of data on your disks, if, if these disks were filled differently, it means that the data on the disk is uh, fragmented differently, which, make, which may make some artifacts in testing. Uh, and because um, sometimes you cannot do them absolutely the same, there is another uh, trick. So you do A-B test, then you swap the parts. So basically, you, you, you run the, the merge branch on A and the master branch on B, and then you do the opposite and compare the results. Uh, you need to test across all supported uh, configurations that you do, your newer box, your previous generation box, and your end of uh, support box. And uh, as you aggregate the metrics in some graph system, uh, you should not aggregate results from different hardware revisions because uh, there can be a change that improves performance on one generation of boxes, degrees, uh, degrades on the others. If you sum them up, there is no change. <laughs> uh, and when we talk about what metrics you should monitor, as much as you can imagine. Uh, so, at, uh, so there are obvious things like the traffic, the CPU usage. Uh, in our Netflix case, we look for uh, device reported errors, which means the, the TV screens or smartphones that watch Netflix, they report, hey, I had, had so many issues with uh, low buffer or has so many issues with that. So, so everything that is uh, crucial to your business, you should pu put it into monitoring and A-B test should check that. Uh, so here is just an example of A-B testing that looks just fine and that's a very trivial uh, metric, it's a uh, network interface output, and looks like the lines are pretty much the same, so that's, that's a pass, the test has passed. So here's another example where we see that definitely there is a difference. Uh, does it mean it is a regression? Not necessarily, maybe that was part of the plan, but we need to be aware that something has changed. And uh, as an example, I took pretty exotic metric, so we are dividing uh, gigabits per watts, which after reducing the seconds ends in bits per joule. So how many bits per joule we, uh, we spent, uh, so how many bits we can send per joule of energy spent. Um, so here in the audience there is David, who is our wizard of A-B testing, and uh, this topic of A-B testing, it deserves another one hour lecture, how to do it properly. So you can ask David a questions on A-B testing. And uh, yeah, one thing I didn't mention that you should automate analyzation, uh, anal analysis of uh, A-B test result, but also you need a non-artificial intelligence to look at the result. You need some person to look at the results and uh, say that, yeah, looks, lo looks like we, we passed the test. So if something goes wrong with your testing, uh, you got two options. You basically go through the commit logs, you look through the diffs, and you find what caused the regression. Or you can run git, git bisect. 
Uh, in any way, uh, you find the offending change that create a regression, and again, you got two options. Uh, you can fix it yourself, or you can get in touch with the person who did the regression. And uh, the more often you do the merge, the easier is the second option, uh, because the code is fresh. Uh, the, the person is still working in this area. Um, and usually, uh, the person will be quite grateful for, for the bug report on, on the freshly committed code. And, and of course, this fix yourself and contact the author, these two things can be combined. You can work, you can work with the developer together. And then you test the game. So, so, so once the regressions discovered are fixed, you test the game. And everything is ok. Uh, then the answer is trivial. You, you, merge, you, merge, you merge the merge branch to your main branch. Um, and now let's talk about uh, the, the other mm, category of code flow from open source to your project, which I ca co earlier called early adoption. So be it a feature that you anticipate as a good improvement or be it a feature that you fear, the technique is pretty much the same. Uh, you want the developer who works on this feature uh, share their code in some repo. Maybe GitHub, maybe some private repo, but you need access to it. Then you just fetch his branch, and again you run subtree merge, Sa same command you would run with uh, the normal FreeBSD merge, but you merge now not from the FreeBSD main, you merge from this developer branch. One important footnote. Uh, you need to make sure that uh, this developer said they synchronize to the FreeBSD main at the same points as you synchronize. Because if, they, if their branch is ahead of FreeBSD main, it means that with this merge, you will pull not only their changes, you will also pull fresh FreeBSD. Uh, it is unlikely, but if their change is behind your, uh, behind your sync point with FreeBSD, it most likely will merge fine but you'll be testing uh, something different to what uh, later will happen. So, so that's one, one important thing. Uh, so, so this is a real, so this example is not just typing out of my head, it's a real example that was Pierre, who was, uh, Horben is his login name, who was leading the OpenSL import. And we contact, get, get in touch with him, we said that we're concerned about OpenSL 3, so we'll be testing it, can you please synchronized to this FreeBSD hash. We did that, we ran A-B test, we got the results, and, and people in the community are usually grateful that, it, it, so it doesn't look like you are stopping them, uh, like you are putting a bar saying that, please don't commit it to FreeBSD main before Netflix says good. No, it doesn't look like that. It looks different. Uh, it, for the people, that, they, are, they, are, they are glad that somebody tests their work and th that makes them more confident with finally committing to main because they, they can put a tag tested by Netflix. Uh, so this early adoption is very much recommended. And uh, yeah, obviously you need to test. Uh, so once you're satisfied with the results, there could be, the, the code flow can go in two directions. So the feature is committed to FreeBSD first, and then you just merge FreeBSD main or if you are looking forward into this uh, cool performance improvement, as my early example of VM page cache, you commit it to your operating system first, and then months later it gets into FreeBSD, and if, every, if the patches were exactly the same, you got a new merge. If they were not exactly the same, you will get some minor conflicts that probably you will be able to resolve. Uh, and now let's talk about the code flow in the opposite direction. Bec uh, you want to reduce the divergence of your operating system to FreeBSD, and that means that you need to upstream your changes. Uh, and, uh, and you cannot do this through an, an anonymous GitHub. That means that you need to find a person who will do that. Uh, so the options are uh, pretty simple. You hire a person who is a committer. You work with a uh, community, uh, which usually ends up in a committer <laughs> in your company. Uh, but anyway, th this requires time. So, so, so th there should be a paid person in your company 
who spends time on upstream things. Or you can contract Clara <laughs> or maybe some other company who will do that work for you. Um, I'm very grateful for uh, yesterday Alan's, um, uh, Alan's talk about upstream first because he did a very good uh, uh, explanation of why spending this uh, developer time actually pays out in the future. Uh, why upstream first? Uh, because that's reduced the technical debt. And um, <clears throat> I, I'm not going to repeat him. I'm very good that he did the talk. So um, the code that flows from your uh, fork to FreeBZ can be categorized into uh, several categories. So the trivial ones are that are bug fixes because every open source project is glad to fix reported bugs. And um, uh, the code that basically doesn't change many lines, that adds some lines. This is also usually easily upstreamable well, un unless the code is super bad. <laughs> and the non-trivial code is that the code that changes lots of lines. And uh, I, I split it into demanded changes. And with demanded, I mean that uh, the other people will appreciate the, this code added to FreeBSD. So for example, FreeBSD is lacking some functionality. The other operating system will already have it, the FreeBSD is lagging behind. And you come with this code. The project usually is glad to accept it. Or uh, some performance optimization, because everybody loves performance optimizations. Uh, so when you come with this code, it's, uh, uh, there is less friction with uh, getting it in, but it's still uh, complex because it changes lots of lines, requires reviews, and so on. Uh, refactoring and cleanups, uh, which uh, sometimes uh, mm, uh, they, they precede the other important changes. So, so be, bef before submitting some meaningful change, which goes to the de demanded change category or bug fix, you want some cleanup. And finally, there are experimental ideas, uh, which is something that the community doesn't understand uh, why you want to add this to FreeBSD. Why is it useful? Why it is a good idea to have that in the repo? And as Alan said, upstream first, this applies, in, in my opinion, this applies to everything except the last. Please do not upstream first your experimental ideas. Uh, because we have had uh, experience of code appearing in FreeBSD, which a year after is known not to work anywhere. I mean, there is no company, there is no user who utilizes this code. It sits in FreeBSD. Uh, it needs to be compilable. Uh, people who do changes, they need to take care of this code to keep it compilable. Uh, there are some users who may look at it and try it out, but it doesn't work any longer. It's just compilable. So it's, uh, it actually, in several years after, an abandoned experimental idea slows down the project. Uh, it also reduces your karma as a code submitter. So ne next time, it will be more difficult to submit code. Uh, so everything that Alan said is correct, except experimental ideas. Uh, but you still, if, if you're going forward with your ideas, you actually, uh, everything starts with experimental idea. Not, not, nothing starts with uh, established idea. So how, how, how to do them correct? Uh, so there are two ways. So one is a trivial one. So you, you take your vendor OS, you make a branch, and you start hacking. Um, this, this immediately creates some diversions from FreeBSD, which um, later, uh, if, if the idea pans out, it's good. You need to go around all the, you, need to, you need, basically need to run recursive diff, uh, find all the places of diff that belong to the idea carefully connect them together and, and submit a patch. Or if the idea doesn't pan out, uh, you need to remove them from your tree. Or you, you, you may forget to remove them from your tree and remove it years later with more friction. <laughs> but uh, still, this way actually sometimes work. Uh, I'll get later when it works. So the other way 
is that you branch a crazy idea in a separate repo, which is a FreeBSD repo, not your vendor OS repo. So in a FreeBSD repo, you branch a new branch that will be called your crazy idea. And then you establish the same workflow that happens with the early adoption. Uh, so this is the same that was in, in the open cell example, but now it's a graphical representation of that that will help you to understand what's going on. So you dump your crazy idea out of your brain to your branch. And this branch is a FreeBC branch. And then you do subtree merges to, to a branch in a different wrapper. So you run two, two wrappers at the same time. Um, this immediately creates a little bit of friction for every commit. Uh, that means that you first commit to, to one repo and then you immediately subtree merge to the other. So like you need to run two, co two commands at a time. But uh, this tiny friction at your development time results in a big time savings when you're done. So when you're done, you have uh, a separate branch that has all your crazy idea done, complete, and ready for submission to FreeBSD. And now you can upstream first. Or not upstream first. You can, in parallel, put it in your repo and then FreeBSD, or vice versa. And because this development can take months and months and months, uh, and uh, the vendor OS goes forward, there are changes from your colleagues, you run merges, uh, you run merges from vendor OS to your branch. And because FreeBSD also goes forward, you run subtree merges from FreeBSD to your vendor OS main, and you run regular merges to your crazy idea branch. And here you see a small footnote and it is exactly the same footnote as was uh, with the early adoption example. You need to make sure that you merge the same hashes from FreeBSD to two to, to, uh, branches. So when you're done, uh, yeah, so basically this, uh, the, this was the graphical representation of the workflow, and this is the common line the representation of workflow. So uh, everything that was on the previous slide typed as, as, a, as a code. And during the, uh, during the process, you can share your idea with the community without any risk to leak company private data. Because the idea lives in a repo that is forked of FreeBSD. It's not forked of your vendor OS. So you can, uh, at the same time, share it to GitHub and merge to your internal repo. And um, you can create FreeBSD reviews on Fabricator with, with the same command line. Uh, and th th this allows, so this workflow allows you to, sh to share your ideas with the outside community and your internal colleagues at the same time. Uh, so now let's touch the topic that a code flow that doesn't happen. So apparently, if we talk about the FreeBSD fork uh, of uh, your OS, it means that there actually will be some diversion. Because if there is zero divergence, it's not a fork. Uh, some diffs will remain. Uh, some diffs will remain. Uh, so uh, apparently, this is some intellectual property that you don't want to share with, with the big world. Uh, uh, at Netflix, we are happy that we don't have any because all our intellectual property lives in Hollywood. Uh, in, <laughs> in FreeBSD, we share everything. So that makes our life easier. I'm sorry, it doesn't apply to everyone. The other reason is uh, a code that has zero value to the, to the outside world. So basically, it is so specific to your project that there is no point in sharing it, and the project will not accept it. There may be other reasons, um, but anyway, there will be code not to be shared. So how to deal with it? So first, plan ahead. So when you change to FreeBSD sub three and start editing files, immediately decide to what category this code falls. Is it going to be upstreamable at some point? Or it definitely is not going to be. So when you start some editing, just clearly tell yourself, this is going to be upstreamed, or no, this is not going to be upstreamed. And this actually uh, affects on how you hack with it. 
So if we uh, go with upstreamable code, everything said before. If we go with non-upstreamable code, these are uh, the best practices that we have. So if it is a userland application, do not drop it into FreeBSD user bin. Create a port for it. If it is a kernel, try to modularize it, isolate it as much as you can. If very likely the module infrastructure, which allows you to create syscalls, device drivers, will not be enough for you. Uh, so you need to, uh, to provide some isolation level that you will upstream and then uh, use this KBI as a gate between your shareable code and non-shareable code. So um, to give an example is Netflix provided the pluggable TCP stacks. So we create a gateway between the, uh, the base TCP stack and then there are advanced TCP stacks. There is a structure that describes them and now you can make your own TCP stacks without editing any code in sys net i net. Uh, I, know, I know that Juniper does the same for the whole stack. Uh, so so th this is how it should be done. And once you, ha once you have these diffs, uh, learn them and know about them. So, so that any divergence point should be known. You should know why it exists, uh, who is the author internally in your company, who maintains it, uh, why it is useful. Maybe it is no, no longer useful. Maybe you can drop it. Maybe you're no longer needed. So document your divergence from, from the upstream FreeBSD um, and monitor it. So, you know, we just sometimes, w once half a year, we just d run recursive diff and look w w w what divergence we accumulated for no good reasons. And, and then we say, okay, let's, let's upstream that. Uh, let's drop that. Let's refactor and upstream that. So uh, reduce, the tech, reduce the technical debt. Um, speaking of ports, I mentioned ports in the last slide. Uh, I suggested that all your user land software should be written as a port. Uh, it's very likely that your vendor OS will use, uh, it is not very likely, it's, I'm 100% sure that your vendor OS will use some components that are not part of FreeBSD but are ports. Maybe Nginx, maybe um, Apache, maybe, oh, well, de definitely. So how to deal with them? The collection right now of the ports is over 30,000 and you're, uh, you're going to be use a small fraction of them. Even if you use half a thousand, which is very unlikely, uh, it's still a fraction. And they are running, uh, in the FreeBSD project, the ports as a single repo. So basically, uh, somebody changes some GTK component that you're not interested in. This is a new, new revision of main, of ports, of ports main. And the infrastructure of the ports, which is port slash MK, is also embedded into the same repo. So, so the, the infrastructure and, and the ports themselves is, is just one repo. Uh, so how to deal with that? Uh, uh, maybe just import uh, all the ports as a subtree to the, the same way that we did with FreeBSD. Uh, so at Netflix, we skipped this step. <laughs> so we, we didn't go with this straightforward uh, decision because initially back in 2015, we had about 30 ports only. Maybe if we had 5,000, uh, sorry, 500, maybe we would go with this stupid step. But we skipped it. We went with uh, something that looked like a good idea back at the beginning. So, so basically, you, you grab a port, and you commit it, and um, two months later when you update the ports, you grab it again, uh, just copy it on top, and again you commit it. So uh, apparently you lose the history. Uh, also, it is very likely that you will have diversions in the ports too. It's very, very likely that you will uh, reduce some ports, like uh, reduce their functionality and so on. 
And the maintenance of these uh, divergent ports becomes a headache. So basically, uh, with every port update, you're constantly losing uh, data, and then you run like a small note, no, notepad.txt file where when you merge ports, please don't forget about this diff. <laughs> So, so it, it all becomes like like pre CDS times, <laughs> uh, but what we we have this stage. Uh, the next stage is called um, subtree split. So Git subtree split um, it belongs to the Git subtree uh, subsystem, but it actually is uh, completely different functionality. For some reason, it lives in the same module. It, it does the opposite. Instead of adding a subtree with uh, history, with hashes, with, without changing hashes to your tree. It does the opposite. It goes through the history of some other tree, extracts all the commits that belong to certain path, and builds a new branch, apparently with new hashes, because uh, there is uh, uh, different data. But, but, it, but this branch has your path isolated, and it has history. Uh, so we used that for several years. Uh, it worked pretty good, but it had several issues. So first, the split process is super slow. So to go, so this is to go through the whole history of FreeBSD ports, it took three hours on a pretty uh, powerful box. And Git subtree split to, to, to split one to split one path, you, it needs to do a one run. So if you want to split. Uh, multiple ports, you need to run this process multiple times. And also, it stores metadata on the created branch that, e that allows you to do a subsequent split. So, so, so first you split from the beginning of the history, and then you want, a uh, couple months later, you want to, to continue the splitting with more fresh commits. And it's to store metadata on the branch. And then it picks up, and basically it had bugs. It had bugs with this metadata, and combined with the super slow, uh, super slow splitting, uh, we came to our own uh, script. So, uh, so this tool, and I highly recommend this tool to anybody who is going to run a small subset of ports, uh, does the following. So it does the same thing as subtree split, but it splits as many ports at one run as you want. So if you use 200 ports, it will split 200 branches at one run. So, so you spend three hours only once. Uh, it will not store metadata uh, anywhere in history. You need to uh, store it externally. So basically you write down, my last, my last update, uh, yeah, you need, you need to write down only one hash, which is not a big deal, so you, so you just, write down one hash, my last split ended here, and that means that next time I will restart my split from this hash. And, uh, and once you got all the, uh, all the ports, uh, port, port branches created with the history, you just git sub three, the, git sub three add them uh, to your repo, or if you're doing update, you git sub three merge. Um, that uh, finalizes my uh, sharing of best uh, practice, and this practice was accumulated by a large team of people who work at Nexus, uh, who worked at Nexus before. Uh, these older names. That this is how we accumulated all this experience. Uh, thanks to them. Thanks for y to you for listening. Uh, if you got questions, I can answer them. Or I can briefly touch some topic that is strongly connected to this, but it's not a lecture on, it's not a best practice, it's more like a discussion point that I want to bring to the community. If you got questions, um, please ask, because it looks like I got about 15 minutes, which is good. So I don't see questions, so let's try your discussion okay. topic. <laughs> uh, so I want to suggest 
some change that um, came to my mind as I was doing the regular FreeBSD merges. Um, that, uh, so basically when we at Netflix run our FreeBSD merge and David does his excellent A-B testing, it ends up in a very good point in FreeBSD current. For us, for Netflix, it's just excellent point. <laughs> so uh, if some other people will synchronize with us in merging to FreeBSD, uh, merging from FreeBSD, that will create even more stable points. Uh, and then if we come to the community and say, you know, we have some, some schedule, some cadence of merging, let's synchronize your development cadence with our testing cadence. So for example, let's say that every last week of a month is a stabilization week, which means please do not drop your huge chunks of diff. Please focus on bug fixes. Uh, I'm not suggesting to make it a policy because I think in FreeBSD project we are very good at making advices or gra gracious uh, wishes uh, instead of tools. So for example, we, we still do not require Fabricator to be run uh, for every commit, but we strongly recommend that. And I think it works pretty good. Uh, we, we do not force people for the certain format of the commit log but 99% uh, follow this format. So, so this uh, stabilization week will not be a policy that will ban your commits. It will just a recommendation that, hey, we entered stabilization week. This is a very good week for you to update your desktop if you run for busy current. This is a very good week to update your vendor OS if you work in, for some vendor. Um, this is a very good week to build a snapshot for the snapshots.freebc.org. Uh, um, and the testing uh, that are done by different parties can be uh, run at the same time. So I think everybody will benefit from that. And we will have snapshots marked. So, so right now, the snapshots are built in a pretty much automatic manner. So if the current builds, we got a snapshot. Uh, and now we'll have. Um, like community approved snapshots. A snapshot that, uh, that has, has been tested by several vendors and several people. Um, the release engineering can also use this, uh, well, we do not branch stable branch often, but we, we branch it every couple of years. And in my humble opinion, it's a disaster every time. So the release engineering wants to keep, to keep the people from touching for busy current and the people are trying to rush with as many changes to the FreeBSD current as they can, and that's create a conflict. And as John said before, the branching point doesn't need to be today's hash. It can be hash in the past. And this stabilization week um, hash, one of them, can be a good fork point for FreeBSD stable. Um, and this whole practice, it just will make developers, you know, a little bit more at planning. So if you have any input about that idea, um, you're welcome to speak out. I'll really appreciate I, I see raised hands. So I, I like the idea, although if I'm, say, Netflix, I'm going to say, well, you know, it's going to be really stable at the end of the month, so that's when I ought to take it. And then, of course, you do your tests, and so you get your more stable one like a week after that instead of yeah, this doing is what all your testing, you know, in, in at the, the peak of it being at its worst state. Yes, so this is what happens. We start FreeBSD immersion Monday. I cook a branch, uh, and, and if we are low on conflicts, I hand it to David Monday uh, evening. Uh, he, he starts to run tests, and by Tuesday, Wednesday, we got some uh, results. And sometimes we have regressions. And then we fix these regressions, work with community, and fix them by Friday. And usually, uh, because some more changes happened until Friday, we just cherry pick them. So instead of, instead of jumping from Monday to Friday, we just cherry pick uh, because it's more conservative approach. 
Sometimes, sometimes, if we had so many regressions that it's easier to, you know, to do a jump, we, we, we like uh, retry from scratch. But if that all happened in the stabilization week, so basically if between Monday, Friday, we do not anticipate breaking changes, then we will not cherry pick. We will just uh, commit the bug fixes uh, or the person who, who helped us to fix them commits uh, these bug fixes. And then we remerge to Friday. Uh, and th 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 this is how it's going to be <laughs> in the ideal <laughs> uh, scenario. I guess something I like about this is that there's a bunch of things that are really awkward to test, like does the installer work, um, things yeah. like that. And I think having a clear window where you know we want to make sure that by Friday everything's good, that gives us an opportunity to seek volunteers to, for instance, you know, try out the installer on your favorite platform, make sure it. So basically, know, this adds another 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 point right. to this list, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I know for Cherry BSD, one of our strategies is uh, we merge weeks at a time, um, and we pick Fridays as our starting point because people break crap over the weekend, and then it gets fixes during the week. So I, I like aligning on assuming that Fridays are kind of be when we're probably no, no, no likely problem. to be a little uh, better stable. We, we, like I, I can do it on Friday, and then no, 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 actually... No, 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 I mean, your, your schedule aligns with kind of our experience with how it works in yeah. Cherry BSD. Is it people commit things over the weekend that tend to be less stable than things that are committed midweek. Hmm. So that usually, usually the stability is like That's a bunch a of crap like Saturday morning and you're like, very oh, and then they, you know, then by Monday very, they're like very, fixing very, it all. Very interesting <laughs> observation. And then so by Friday, Fridays are a good stable point. So I, I think this will work well with how we already kind of function. Did you have a question? Maybe people Did drink more on the weekends. <laughs> I think this would make an excellent um, panel session or discussion at um, future uh, summits and things as well. Um, one question I was thinking about is just what cadence, um, like whether it's monthly, every six weeks, um, bi-monthly, what, what cadence will work best um, uh, as, as a whole? So I'm thinking about monthly, but it doesn't mean that every vendor should go monthly. So. So, for example, we at Netflix will probably do it monthly, but somebody else can do it bi-monthly, just synchronized with us. Or somebody do it uh, quarterly, uh, but, ag but, ag so be but again, it will fall on the same week. I mean, I think the point about monthly, too, is there's, there's the vendors, this one side of the equation, who are pulling and are hoping to have this stable point to pull from. Um, and then there's... I'll say this, training our developers to get used to this kind of schedule and basically just don't dump your experimental crap during the last week of the month. Really, that's what I think this boils down to in, in the single sentence form. I say don't, 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 don't dump your experimental crap. Uh, well, I like your earlier point about, <laughs> I, I said it on IRC, which is don't dump and then abandon your experimental crap <laughs> full stop. Like that's, that is definitely a, a very true point and one that we have some scars from. So does anyone else have questions, by the way? Yeah, I see Pavel. I think this is similar to what uh, Kirk said, but uh, uh, I like the idea because it's, it's <laughs> I had this problem with my laptop all the time, but uh, uh, I'm sure you also like uh, with cherry picking, right? You, you t take a, a, a specific hash and then you realize, okay, there are some bugs that were fixed in like two weeks or something like that. So you just cherry pick because you don't want to slide uh, two weeks of changes, right, forward. Uh, but I uh, also wonder if, uh, if you just give one week for this stabilization period, if, it, it not, if people uh, wouldn't want to wait for this week to do some like, upgrades on the laptop, so basically, you, you won't get any testing within those three weeks where the changes were made and everyone just uh, upgrades uh, on the last week and then they report back. So before the fixes goes in, we're already in the next period. So, uh, so you're suggesting a, a short-lived branch? Uh, to be honest, I have no suggestion. <laughs> I'm just like uh, thinking out loud uh, 
Yeah, branching in Git is cheap. We can create a short-lived stabilization branch. Because, for example, what, what we do, uh, we what we release and we uh, provide our upgrades uh, for our product to the customers, those can live for many months, and customers would prefer not to upgrade because, for example, it just works. Uh, so we don't have this luxury as Netflix. But uh, but what we do when we test, we we uh, we split the testing into like uh, the stabilization period, uh, and then you have. So, for example, in this uh, in this scenario, you will have like uh, second to last week of every month, you stop dumping experimental changes. We stabilize. But there is also, and people can uh, start like upgrading, testing, and stuff like that. And the last week, uh, all the we try to so get all the fixes in, right? So at the end of the month, we have like a s pretty stable current. Uh, but uh, this just complicates the whole process. <laughs> I, that's not a suggestion. Just well, I think to your point, Pavel, you're you're worried about people being lazy. Which is a common. I'm not. I always have similar worries. I think we would have to strongly encourage our developers to make this work. You need to actually test at the beginning and not wait for everyone else to fix all the bugs for you. You have to be participatory. So everyone would have to be on board with the fact that when we hit the "Don't dump your crap in the tree" week, um, at the start of that, everyone needs to actually upgrade their laptops and suffer through the week jointly. Um, so that we then fix it during the week. Because I think that's what makes this work, is we all have to be testing during the week to fix during the week. So I do, I do think it's important that, I, mean, I, I like the idea of imposing restraint for a period, and you know, a week a month seems good to me. I feel like any more than that would be really a problem. Yeah, I think the duty cycle, duty cycle of business as usual needs to be at least 75%, maybe higher. It might, I mean, I might say like the five days of the last yeah. week of the month is your period. And like, you know, people should expect to get whacked if they <laughs> commit garbage on Sunday, but <laughs> um, you know, if they rush something in. But you know, I, I think like it needs to be business as usual the majority of the time. Yeah, we don't want to. And business as usual is quite We, we don't want to days. slow down the developers uh, strongly. Yeah, I agree. I, th I think. Brooks is right. And I guess what I was trying to say to, to Pavel, I don't know that a technical solution like more branches is how we should solve this. I think it's a social problem that with just uh, educating our developer community about we want to do this, and this is how, this is the rules everyone kind of needs to, or the guidelines. I think you're right about that too, but the guidelines are pretty good with dealing with reasonable guidelines that we want everyone to follow to make this work. And I, I think if we pitch it that way, I think it's something we can sell and that will probably work. Yeah, uh, oh, so, 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 one, one second. Uh, so, so some tooling I actually uh, think should be useful. So for example, a Google Calendar that just automatically, automatically fills all, all these days so that everybody can export this calendar to their calendar and see that. And probably a script that will maybe create a branch, maybe not create a branch, but send the email like, hey, this hash is the hash we recommend you to start your stabilization cycle. Pavel has comment. Uh, so uh, what we also do is we, we are trying to eat our own dog food. So like before we release any version, we will deploy it in our production environment because we use our products as well. So uh, if we could get someone from uh, infrastructure team to be able to like do the upgrades uh, uh, at the start of this week, yep, and then we could test on our infrastructure. That would, yep. be, of course, I'm not volunteering, just to be clear, but uh, <laughs> uh, but that would help a lot, I'm sure. Uh, if we could start like uh, once we start this uh, stabilization period, we upgrade uh, the yeah. cluster, and uh, and then we can find probably more bugs. Yeah, we can promote that we at FreeBSD run at our own. FreeBSD current stabilization points, and we recommend you to run your laptop the same way. <laughs> so one thing I would really like to see is more um, automation and uh, like test gates that can promote an image, say, through various stages, um, so that we could 
uh, as an end user or a developer building something downstream on FreeBSD, I would like to be able to say, I want the most recent hash that has gone through some level of, um, of testing. So like, I know that it boots, or I know that the package set exists for it, or I know that the compiler works. Um, and so I mean, we can get into this discussion um, later on about technical, uh, technical solutions to this. I mean, whether a branch is the right way to go or, or not, all that I think are, are implementation details that we'll need to work out. But I think there is, I have a, ver a very strong interest in being able to have sort of those level of, of gates and I think we need some way to be able to say, you know, that if a, if a, if a change does arrive that kind of causes a big regression, we really do want to be able to get, you know, either productizing or whatever it is, the cherry picking and such that you, you use internally during the week if there's a problem. We want to be able to share that across multiple uh, consumers. I think Pavel and Gleb are just going to talk for a while during our break, and I'm feeling. I have to fight with this every day, so, uh, uh, but uh, automation, I think, is also the key uh, to make this success, because one week or five days is really, uh, of course, we want to make it uh, short, but it's also short to test and report bugs and fix uh, during this week. But uh, maybe we do that, I, I don't know, but if we could extend, like, testing, not only to use our test suites, but also to like uh, select some ports that have test suites, like for example, PostgreSQL or hmm. Engin Nginx, and we do that, or, or LLVM, yeah, yeah. So basically, as much as we can throw at this uh, change at the beginning of this stabilization week, the better, right? Because yeah. uh, not just our test suite, but as many others as possible. Any other questions? I think, yes, I think we're at just, about Just it. in time. Say what? Just in time. Oh yeah, so I think we're good on time. Um, so I think we have our first break for the day. So thank you, Gleb. Thank you very much.